Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, August 26, 2021, and I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys, well, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I often present these sort of myths and legends of the Giants, including that of Jack and the Beanstalk or Jack the Giant Killer as being, you know, a simple propaganda story against the Giants and making it easier to kill them, going all the way into the past, such as when the Giants of Albion were uh, sort of... Uh, pushed out of Britain or killed off, which is probably more likely a tale of giant genocide. And that's what I get at in this video over here as to what the story is really all about. And then things like Paul Bunyan, myths like Paul Bunyan based on a real person. If you don't know anything about it, it's one of the most popular videos on my channel. Almost 2,000 views is a lot for my channel. But it's an interesting story. And this all truths to be gotten at at the bottom of these legends and myths as often as you know some of these um contemporary archaeologists and anthropologists you know they're starting to think that there's some important truths to be got out of these myths and legends and they're not just simply fairy tales you know they're based on some true events or true occurrences or whatever it might be so they're considering these things seriously and we should always do that when it comes to these myths and legends because it seems so very often that they are based on something real that can be discerned from them. So I want to go over one now in this video that you probably never even heard about, but it's based on these writings by... Uh, French uh, writer who's like a contemporary of William Shakespeare and this is how we know it by uh, Rab Rabelais okay and he's a contemporary I guess of Shakespeare and some other important writers and he wrote this sort of parody of these giants that were based on a previous anonymous text but there's some important things to be said in here and that we're going to lay based on the research that I've already done on this channel. I mean, you have to, I've seen some of this actually to understand what I'm trying to say about these things. But when you hear what's being said here and then you can relate it to the things that were occurring in the past, which just many of these sort of everyday sort of things that these people needed to do to survive back then. And... You know, possibly the sort of similar things going on in the Americas is going on in Europe, as I often talk about with, you know, the exploits of the giants and how they, you know, the archaeology and anthropology sort of points out the similarities between, and you know, the skeletal remains, etc. So, what's going on with these stories? So, this one is about the great mare from French mythology, French legend, and... It's interesting what they say in this, and I'll point out what these things are. We can relate them to things that we've already discussed on my channel before. But before I get to that, I just want to say something about, I was listening to Brian Forster, so I often do walking back and forth from work basically all i do is work and sleep and work and sleep there's really no time in between i work so many hours it's just impossible to do anything but i try to listen to things as i'm you know the things that show pictures obviously worthless to listen to but i listen to a few things now and then i listen to brian forster talk about the Paracas people and the DNA research, which is fascinating and interesting DNA that they found there. That's more European than anything, but he's talking about, he again, is a Brian Forster, unfortunately, like a lot of alternative researchers, except some things from mainstream research wholesale, such as this sort of old world, new world paradigm that they've been talking about, and what I call new world bias. 
Okay, we heard in Charles C. Mann's book I've covered on this channel what the archaeologists and anthropologists down there have said that maybe Sumeria isn't the cradle of civilization. Okay, maybe it's in the Americas. Okay, the camel, the horse come from the Americas. Eight of the top superfoods in the world all come from the Americas. Okay, where it appears to be a lot of genetic engineering going on, as far as I'm concerned. So he mentions about the Paracas people that. It relates it to the DNA of the of the elongated skulls found in the Black Sea area, okay? Even though I've covered on this channel about elongated skulls going across the whole entire world and all over the place, including up in North America as well. But it's not necessarily that or one or the other, but, you know, he talks about the Black Sea people and he postulates that the Black Sea people must have migrated here to the Americas because he has this old world, new world bias, that he can't shake for some reason. So there's no evidence to suggest that it couldn't be the other way around. Just as it could be the way that he's postulating, it certainly could have been the other way around, considering that the eight top superfoods come from the Americas here. There's date palms in the areas of Paracas, which they can't figure out where that came from. Okay, so obviously people from the Black Sea area brought it there from the Black Sea area. It's the only way that it could have possibly got there. The people in the area don't eat the dates, so they don't really even know anything about it, even though there are food source there, but maybe because, you know, they had no idea what the Paracas people, what those were, and if they were edible or not, or perhaps they were the foods of the Paracas people and not to be touched by the regular people. So nothing was, nobody ever bothered anything, but Brian doesn't talk about any of that stuff. He just simply postulates this, and there's no reason why it couldn't be the other way around. Does that mean to tell me that the eight top superfoods in the world come from the Americas, and you have date palms in the Americas, and they had to come from somewhere else? Maybe they went from the Americas elsewhere in the world. That's the only pocket of them left in there, okay, where they were growing them and cultivating them, okay, the Brockers people, because they're different kind of people. And then they went elsewhere. There's no reason to think it isn't the other way around. And I say that the new world is a much, much older world where a lot of culture disseminated to the rest of the world from that culture when it was possibly destroyed in the past somehow. Okay, even though there were leftovers like the Adena people and the Galena people. Right? So... I just, it frustrates me to hear Brian Foster talk about these things because there's no reason why it couldn't be the other way around. And as far as I'm concerned, there's more evidence for it being the other way around than what he's suggesting, okay? And what mainstream suggests that all these superfood plants in the Americas were, you know, all, you know, cultivated here and, you know, um done all the horticulture, the people here did all the horticulture to domesticate these plants, et cetera, et cetera, where, as I'm saying, they're all genetically engineered, and whatever plants you find in the wild were derived from that. They were wild, they got wild when they were, you know, just growing wild um, in nature for thousands and thousands of years from the time that they were genetically engineered. Because it seems like corn, no doubt, in my mind, or even the University of California, was a, was a feat of genetic engineering. And probably all these other foods were as well. Okay, as well as people altering themselves genetically in all kinds of shapes and forms and everything else. And all sorts of animals and domestic species, all genetically engineered. They don't know where domestic animals came from. Doesn't matter what they say. Probably this, and it could be that, and it may be that. That's the whole language that they use. Okay, maybe, could be, probably. All right, well, I say not probably, and I say not could be. Okay, it came from somewhere else. It is another explanation for these things that they just can't postulate because they believe in the sort of, you know, canned history that comes out of university and the brainwashing academies that we've all went to. So let's read about the mythology and a legend from French mythology about giants. And I think it's just another story that's trying to tell us something from the past that occurred in the past that these giant peoples were doing in the past 
that was inherited by the, you know, a regular average people that we know of. Okay, so the great mayor, the great mayor, La Grand Mayor, Grand Juan, or Grand Juan in French, was a gigantic mayor that served as a mount for giants in several Renaissance works. Stemming from the medieval traditions inspired by Celtic mythology, she first appeared in the grand and priceless chronicles of the great and enormous giant Gargantua. Written in 1532, in which Merlin created her from the from bones atop a mountain. Okay, so this is based on, you know, King Arthur legends, you know, but it's an anonymous writer that they're talking about here. They don't mention that here, but it's an anonymous writer and, you know, collecting some of these legends from the ancient past. Rabelais was inspired by these chronicles and proceeded to build upon given descriptions, including his writings that the mayor was Gargantua's mount in the very horrific life of the great Gargantua, father of Pantagruel, which was published five years later. It was saddled up to be a parody. Examples of this being the instances when the mayor drowned her enemies with urine and leveled all of the trees in boats, transforming the region into a plain. So, there's some very interesting things right here that are being said. Well, Rabelais, okay, was a contemporary writer with William Shakespeare and a few other important writers, okay. Was he trying to help conceal the past by writing this parody of the giants based on these legends, you know, Celtic legends, etc., etc.? Could that be? And also, this leveled all the trees of both transforming the region to a plane I find of interest and we'll read on and it'll be more to be said about it but this again is some of the behavior of people in the past who were learning how to survive and live in the ancient past and they needed to do things like we similar to we do today when we clear land, etc., etc. Okay, this animal seemingly originated from the primeval dragon modeler or from the mountain of Celtic gods, according to Henri Dotonville and Claude Gangbet. The mount shares the same origin as Bayard's horse. There are also toponyms in, dedicated to her without direct connections to Renaissance writings. So other references to this white mare and Bayard's horse was just some mythical horse that could increase its size or decrease its size from legend origin okay so here's a gargantuous great mare and here's the scene normal sized people and a gargantuous mare and his horse are dressed in armor here that's interesting. As seen in two major Renaissance literary works, the great mayor likely arose from popular tradition stories and ancient oral folklore. Many theories exist regarding her origin, with the majority of them having been put forth by Henri Dotville. According to him, the original Grand Mare had a white coat, a direct reference to the ancient established presence of the white horse in French folklore. She was ridden by a giant aquiped, a deity with a rooster's head and serpent for legs in the oldest versions of her stories. Okay, so it's this creature with serpent legs, which can be reckoned back even to the Greeks and Romans. The giant Gargantua is reminiscent of Gargon, a demiurge known by Celtic people. A demiurge is like Atlas, you know, holding up the world and, you know, just has to do with that. He was a builder and creator of whom it is said marked out all of the pre-Christian pilgrimage routes and created chasms and mountains by stomping up and down on the earth. And here we have very similar stories to the giants in other ancient folklore, okay, about marking out all the pre-Christian pilgrimage routes. Well, those could very well be all these trails and highways, like the Adena trails and highways and the Michigan Indian trails of importance to Michigan. Who were they made by? Well, they were made in ancient times when the Adena were present, these giant peoples of the Americas in the Ohio Valley, okay? So just keep all these things in mind when we're talking about these things, okay? 
myths about that as well. Myths on the East Coast of the good giants and how they did all these wonderful things. Okay. So, in addition to this, it is believed that he dug fords as he drank from streams and created rivers by urinating. Okay. So, here's the kind of things that, you know, um, would be parodied or whatever, but we're parodying them, but they have this truth behind them about the giants who lived in the past, okay, and what they were doing, altering the landscape, like the people of Snaketown, Arizona, who were building um, very intricate and complicated canal systems that it would require a team of, surveyors, of surveyors a month of analysis to create the same sort of canals today, you know. So, you know, again, if people of the ancient past, possibly these giants had knowledge, knowledge in building, knowledge in stonework, knowledge in materials like gravel and sand and other kind of materials used to make concrete and maybe possibly even geopolymer. Okay, this is all the things that you could have learned on my channel had you been following along with all the videos on my channel, okay? We're building a picture of the past here, the truth, okay? Not all these wild, fanciful things that even the mainstream want to make up their own fairy tales about this. You're not hearing the truth by anyone, not, not by any of these other people either who appear on coast to coast and tell all kinds of wild stories that have no truth to them. Okay. According to Daltonville, the mayor and its rider were mistakenly taken for a dragon and is attested in the etymology of GRG, a reference found in the names of the giants of Rabelais, Grand Goussier, Gargamel, and Gargantua. As a result of their similar similarities and histories, the Great Mare and Baird's Mare share the same narrative folklore, that of a gigantic primitive dragon who transforms landscapes with her actions. Another speculate is this a reference also to the dragon that's referred to in the Electric Universe and Thunderbolts project that transforms the landscape? Is this a continuation of the story? But also based on real things that people did, okay? So people also transformed the landscape. Like the people up here in Iroquois territory where the walled areas are, okay? Or anywhere where earthworks occur or whatever. You're transforming the landscape, right? But this also refers to maybe something that went on in the ancient past, like in the Thunderbolts project. What, what Velikovsky was talking about and what David Talbot talks about what dragons really are, comets or uh, meteors. Another speculation of her origin is that the mare was the mount of Gallic psychopomp goddess Epona. I think psychopomp refers to like, that would be like Charon, um, a sort of, um, you know, deadpan character, no emotion that brings you to the land of the dead or something like that. The Celtic origin was referenced by Henri Dautenville, who wrote that there are several gods accompanied by a white horse or a white mare who would gallop from the east to the west, bringing to pass springtime each year and pulling the sun along with them. This symbolic motif is also used by Jacques de Chaussy, de, de Chaussy and classifies these creatures as a celestial being. Okay, so we didn't have like a Thunderbolts project reference, but also this clearing of the land because as we know from my videos, we heard about the Native Americans in Charles C. Mann's book and how they took care of the land by managing the land by burning, often burning, okay, to transform the landscape, to get rid of the bugs, to clear fields for growing, etc., etc., Okay, this is often occurrence in the past, not only by the people in Americas, but the people in Europe as well, the ancient peoples. And not the people we're familiar with, the past that existed with a whole different 
variety of humanoid peoples living in the past, like Tolkien's J.R.R. Tolkien's trilogy and Hobbit. That's the reality of it, folks. Not anything you've learned. That's all junk. Fit to wipe your behind with. It's all a bunch of nonsense. Once you graduate school, that's when you start learning. You see? Not before. Only after. That's when you start learning the truth about the past. After you get out of school. Testimonials and toponyms. The legend of the Great Mare and other similar tales of white horses are present in French beliefs and toponyms related to the West Coast Sea. On the banks of the Loire in Tours, there exists a white horse inn on the wharf of the Grand Jouan. A 25 by 25 meter granite monolith named the Great Mare exists in Montgolfier and was mined from 1800 to 1803 by Ernst Poulinen, a quarryman who also destroyed another block of granite in order to pay homage to local legends. In Paul Sablo's connection of popular traditions, it is written that the sea in Poitou is referred to as the Great White Mare, and Mar is also another name for sea. The, na the same name is used by fishermen in Vendée. In the 16th century, Noel de Fale described the sea as being the great Margot Mare, who is bridled by her tail. In addition to this, off the coast of Oussant, there exists La Jumont Lighthouse built on the Argazic Reef, the Mare in Breton. Bernard M. Henry of the Friends of Rabelais and La Divinière Association noted the existence of several boulders that had been named the Horses, the Mare, and the Great Mare in Sable de Long. He wrote that he believed the existence of these toponyms and the city they belonged to inspired Rabelais to write the arrival of the Great Mare. According to French Mythological Society, this Great Mare made gigantic imprints that can still be seen in modern day, one with the Jura Mountains and the second in Normandy. Okay, so these are similar to the tales that the Algonquin Indians tell about the good giants from their area creating these islands and doing you know, good things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's so similar to these tales here. It could almost be identical in some ways. I venture to say. We've talked about it in the channel. I read to you from the mainstream research about it. Okay? It's another place where they stick their foot in their mouth and they don't put two and two together and not looking at different things and seeing the whole picture. And they don't want to either. Well, you know, or, you know, have to withstand ridicule if they come with up with any sort of their own conclusions. You have to follow the narrative. Simple as that. Bernard M. Henri of the French... Okay. According to French, the great mayor, the gigantic image of the modern day... One within the Jura Mountains and the second in Normandy. So that's interesting. I like to see those. The Great Mare and the Great and Inestimable Chronicles of the Great and Enormous Giant Gargantua. The Great Mare made one of its most notable appearances in the Great and Priceless Chronicles of the Great and Enormous Giant Gargantua, an anonymous text that was, in older accounts, written in 1532. This is surmised as it contains... References to France and Breton matters. The writings report that Merlin was to advise King Arthur to be on guard against his enemies, and Merlin left the king's court. He decided to go to the Mont d'Orient to make the giants Grand Gousier and Galamel from whale bones. After that, he created the great mare from the many bones of other mares. According to Bernard Sergin, this theme of creating beings from bones could be a direct reference to a shamanic motif. Motif. Regardless, the great mare is undeniably a fey creature because it was forged by Merlin, who had many connections to the fey. Okay, so... 
a fey creature is legendary creature found in the folklore of multiple European cultures, a form of spirit often described as metaphysical, supernatural, or preternatural. Okay? So it's a supernatural creature. The beast's purpose was to serve as a mount for giants. She was a great Flemish mare, interesting mare, Flemish, one so powerful that she carried them, Grand Goussier and Galamel, as well as a ten-crowned horse would carry a simple man. The mare belonged to Galamel and Grand Goussier, the parents of Gargantua. When the young giant reached seven years old, his parents decided to present him to King Arthur. Upon their departure, Merlin told them, Turn your mare's reins to the west and let it go on, and it will lead you well without fail. The mare's tail then turned into an axe, and following this, Gargantua then hung the bells of the Notre Dame de Paris Cathedral around her neck. When the young giant entered King Arthur's service, the giant then left the mayor in the forest of Briere le Chateau. Okay, so it's interesting about the bells of Notre Dame in the Paris Cathedral going back to the time of King Arthur. Okay, that's way, way back in time. Okay, again, was, you know, all these buildings and everything. How old are they really? Do we really know? We don't know. We have no idea and no concept of historical time. It's all screwed up. Thanks to all the people who wanted to screw it up. To this day, there is still an often disputed point of whether or not Rabelais is the author of this particular text. So, another thing that they don't know. The great mayor in Rabelais' works, Francois Rabelais, was largely inspired by the grand mayor that was present in the Chronicles, and those inspirations added to the popular traditions of his time, encouraged the creation of Gargantua's giant mount in the very horrific life of the great Gargantua, father of Pantagruel and son of Grand Goussier, written in 1534, and its continuations. In these, he departs from the traditional fairy tales of that time, a genre that the Chronicles and the backstory of the mayor's nature stem from, the great Gargantua is a coming-of-age story and a parody of medieval tales of chivalry. In addition, in this story, the great mayor is given to the young giant by Grand Goussier in order he might go to Paris to learn. In Rabelais' text, Gargantua was trained from childhood in the equestrian arts by riding an artificial riding on artificial horses. The mayor is mentioned for the first time in chapter 16 in a scene which matches up almost verbatim to a passage from the Chronicles. This scene borrowed the concept of the flight of the Notre Dame Blells, which the giant hung around the neck, the neck of his mare. However, under Rabelais' pen script, the passage takes on a new dimension by approaching the themes of culture, politics, morals, religion, and aesthetics. The giant then left Paris on his mare to defend the country and quickly encountered a troop of enemies. To defeat them, the mayor drowned them in her urine. In the aforementioned chapter 16, the mayor is given a tone in the fable that marks a break in the ambiance of the story into a more popular and less academic burlesque. From that point, it has a comedic function, according to George Hoffman. It opposes pedagogical or esoteric interpretation. See? It's supposed to obscure those things. See, this is propaganda that leads you down in another direction to make fun of any sort of actual thing that happened in the past. These myths and legends lead you away from that, okay? Started way back then in 1500s, right? Shortly after that other anonymous one was published, right? So, this Francois Roublet is... Not a good guy at all. Rabelais sets aside supernatural elements in a very distinct manner that the, than the Chronicles or the Four Amon Sons in order for this chapter's background to evoke the concerns of peasants and city dwellers and therefore emphasize the relationship between man and nature. Corgan Abbey, in contrast, compares the Grand Mare to the Bayard Horse of the Song of the Four Amon Sons 
saying that she is a magical creature that stemmed from popular folklore in connection with the alchemical and erudite tradition as a result of her creator, Merlin. Other ancient theories perceive the source of the Grand Mayor's inspiration as possibly being Diane de Poitiers, nicknamed the Grand Seneschal from Rabelais' time. Description deemed bigger and more monstrous than any mare we have ever seen, the Grand Mayor was a gift from Africa sent by Peol's Tetrarch King of Numidi. She was used solely as a means of transport for the giants. She herself was transported to Olon in Thalmondois by four ships, including three large Genoese sailing vessels, the Carracks. Her size was that of six elephants. She had the hanging ears of a languedoc goat with her feet split into fingers like Julius Caesar's horse and a small horn on, on the flank. Her coat was that of burnt chestnut dappled gray in some spots. Isn't that fascinating? Just what was just said there. The ears thus hanging like goats of Languagoth and Little Horn on the rump. The rest was covered in a chestnut coat with crisscross gray. But Grand Humant did not escape the parodic and humor, humorous description that Rabelais was particularly fond of, especially in regard to her gigantism. Gargantua is able to make it to Paris in a few strides of the mayor's gallop and then instantly finds his father. However, it is the urine of the mayor that makes the story especially comical. Indeed, she proves her efficiency by the abundance of her urine. However, even though Gargantua created Rhone by relieving himself, the long-term effects of the man's relief are not detailed either in the Chronicles or in the Rabelais. And from the story that if his father's great mayor had been there and pissed alike, and there had been a deluge larger than that of Deucalion, for she only pissed a river no bigger than the Rosin. Her 200 fathom tall tail was like a St. Marsh pile, a quadrangular tower located near Longay. It dragged behind the mare and divided into multiple branches. The mare gives the impression of Africa at the time as being a land of animality, and its powerful kicks do not refer, according to Guy Demerson, to a supernatural creature like seen in the Chronicles, but in the animality of a simple monstrous creature. On the other hand, according to George Hoffman, this description is akin to natural wonder and calls for animal comparisons to support the generative power of nature. All very interesting, and what about if they're all of the above? Okay, did they ever think about that? No, they just want to argue among themselves, but it could be all of the above because it's based on some actual thing that occurred in the past with giant creatures and giant humanoids. The Bose episode, as mentioned before, as soon as Gargantua received the Grand Mare as a gift, he immediately decided to go to Paris. On his way, Gargantua passed through Bose. At this point in the tale, Rabelais created a new whimsical etymology for this region inspired by the Mare. The passage corresponds to a hero's phase of development which is close to his big horse as he would be close to his small dog. And I feel that this is being said again to sort of, and Rabelais is saying all this to demean a whole reality of giants existing in the past and any other history that happened in the past, including the one that refers to Thunderbolts and Velikovsky and David Talbot, to what they talk about, okay? They want to cover that up too. Bose was covered in a vast forest during the time of this tale, measuring 35 leagues long and 17 leagues wide, infested with biting horseflies and hornets. As soon as she was on her way with her rider, the grand mare was stung by the pest and defended herself by whipping about her tail. She then bucked and kicked in every direction, leveling the entire forest to nothing. The desolation resulted in a vast countryside in which Gargantua exclaimed, I find this beautiful, hence it is said how Bose got his name got its name okay again how these ancient peoples cleared the land by burning it out they burn one of the reasons they burn it out is to get rid of all of the insects as well okay clearing the land was something that just was of a high priority in the past okay 
and referred often to not these heavily forested areas, but in some cases where they needed to manage the forest, okay? They were managing the forest, they were managing the land. We know that in the Americas, and I'm sure a similar thing was occurring in Europe. No different. Okay, these are the things that they're talking about. They're talking about the trails and highways that were there in Europe. They're talking about, you know, terraforming the land. They're talking about clearing lands, maintaining lands, managing lands. This is what these tales are all about. And who were doing these things in the past? Well, giants were. Okay, this is what it's trying to say. All right. Gargantua takes obvious joy from seeing the rampaging damage from his mouth, but is careful not to express, expressly show the emotion, a reaction that is meant to give the reader the impression that he is an adolescent. At the end of its rampage, the mayor proceeds to clear out the rest of the place of hostility and the cleared countryside being one of great beauty. Bose is famous for being monotonous and flat without many landmarks. In the tale, in the tale and in real life, the topic of deforestation was at the center of tensions between the royal authority, the bourgeoisie, and the country folk. This episode could also be a reflection of the fight against illegal grazing of cattle and horses in forested areas, specifically because Gargantua's Mount is a clear representation of the aforementioned livestock that were prohibited from grazing in forests. This episode is presented in the Chronicles with few discrepancies as the destruction of the forest of Champagne of Champagne actually precedes that of both. Okay, so this is clearly to me a reference to clearing of lands in the ancient past by the giant folk or the large hominids or the giants, okay? These were the kind of people who were doing these things in the past, who were more advanced, more advanced in engineering, more advanced in their culture, more advanced in art, more advanced in many, many ways and innovative in very many ways, okay? And what... What um, Rabelais is trying to do is sort of take us off any notion of the reality of these people existing in the past and what they were doing and other occurrences in the past, such as that we're talking about the Thunderbolts Project and Velikovsky and David Talbot and Walt Thornhill and the Electric Universe and all this kind of other stuff. Okay, because these things and many things in the past have multiple meanings, have manifold meanings. Okay, so above is below. So you have to think about these things when you're looking at these things. But to me, it obviously suggests the sort of the establishing of the networks and trail systems in Europe there, the clearing of lands by the giant peoples of the past, who not only were giant themselves, but also giant animal species existed. I've gone over on this channel, and we found some of the burials of the giants buried with enormous thing, animals, like bison, for instance, as we found out in America, a type of bison that's now long extinct. Okay, and all the creatures that could have existed in the Pleistocene and the early Holocene that would be so weird and incredible, like dragons and monsters and everything else. Okay, we, our species was around during that time, so were any other hominid species for that matter. Okay, so look, guys, again, what can these myth mythologies and tales and legends tell us about the past. What are the grains of truth in them? Well, I'm telling you, it's real easy to see this one. As long as we've been doing this for a while and see along those lines and understand these things along those wavelengths, all right? This is a clear tale of the giants and what they were doing in the past, establishing all these trading routes, overland trading routes in the past, and clearing lands. And as far as the contention about deforestation, certainly in the more, uh, you know, m historical societies there was, okay? Because this was something you needed a cooperative for, like, for example, the Iroquois, okay? 
they needed the peoples of these areas needed this cooperative to be because they had a lot of people okay and if you had a lot of people you need a lot of food okay and how can you get a lot of food it can't be supplied strictly by the game animals because they would be hunted to extinction right away okay it's all about these food crops all right and other resources and materials that can only be gotten in some areas okay if you're in the mountainous regions there isn't a lot of areas to grow crops certainly not enough to sustain any major population so you had to be in a cooperative with other people in other areas where it's more conducive more arable land better land better soil whatever it is okay and this is one of the reasons why the iroquois confederation was established because the people living in the lowland areas where it's good to grow crops and everything did not have a lot of wood to use okay they needed the wood that came from the mountainous regions but there is just you know thousands of of you know hundreds of thousands of acres of forested timber you know timber in these mountainous regions okay like a never-ending supply okay and the native peoples of these areas managed the forest they weren't stupid about it like the colonists and settlers who were busy deforesting areas they had to go further and further okay the iroquois didn't have to worry about it okay they put in their order into the tribes that lived in a mountainous region with all the timber and a lot of the fur and all that kind of stuff they put in their order and said hey send us wood because we need wood every day you need food every day and we are growing it down here in the lowlands here where it's more conducive for farming and we'll ship you all that stuff over these trails and over water as well okay between the trails the actual physical you know foot trails and the waterways being used as highways they utilized all these things because they had to deliver enormous amount of good and material okay and as we know from the hopewell and the, the um adena that they were getting raw material in and manufacturing goods so just all this sort of you know material possession of things going on in the past which were created by these people on large scales okay so this is nothing but a tale about how this was also going on in europe an identical thing okay and the legends that we talk about similar to the legends are here in america all peoples doing the same sort of things during the same time periods okay even up into the historical times with the good giants you notice that all east of the iroquois nation over here okay we're there the algonquin peoples and there's stories about the good giants that are so similar to the ones that we just read about in french legends and mythology about the great mare all right and how these giants did these things to create these things okay you have king manga tuxie down there in long island here on the east end of long island building canals that would cost today with all the dredging and everything millions and millions and millions of dollars to do okay so and we heard of john jensen's work with ancient canals and artificial harbors here in america is that had to be being utilized some seven thousand and eight thousand years ago when the water levels were lower all right and probably much easier we heard about they talked about these people and the sea with the great mare and these people bringing the great mayor to europe on these four ships or whatever okay i talked about you know you know i talked about on my channel about the syracuse and the cargo manifest containing corn some you know 15 to 2000 years before christopher columbus discovered the americas yet the um the um uh Syracuse was carrying corn in its hold, some 60,000 pounds of corn in its hold. Okay, so 
Look, guys, this is what this story is talking about, okay? This is all of these stories. I'm trying to decipher them for you. Nobody else is doing any of this. So I'm just going to talk about the cannibal giants, and they're all bad, and they didn't do anything good. And, you know, not like the Adina and everything, but, you know, there had to be good ones and bad ones and all this kind of other stuff, whatever it might be. It's a bunch of nonsense that has nothing to do with the past. All right. Here we're getting to the bottom of things, whether they be through myths and legends or actual accounts of archaeological and anthropological evidence. Okay, so that's all I'm trying to say, folks. We're going to look at more of these giant myths of the, and legends of the giants, and I'm going to put it into a series. We're going to do a, a playlist on this because I think there are important things to be said from these myths and legends that can be deciphered out of them if you know what to look for. Okay? If you're following mainstream, you're never going to get to the bottom of these things, so I admonish Brian Forster to stop doing that. Okay, it's not the new world, Brian. All right, it's the old, old world. All right, and all the things you're talking about is the other way around. Okay, the Baragas people went to the Black Sea area and they brought their palms with them, their date palms with them, and every other vegetable from the Americas. All right, and the whole story about how these all these vegetables got there, the rest of the world is a bunch of baloney. People have been coming back and forth as the secure Syracuse cargo manifest attests to. All right, corn thousands of years before Columbus. All right, stop listening to the bullshit mainstream academic stories of the past. There is no truth to any of those things. All right, not even a little bit. Okay, Brian, right? It's not the new world. It's the old, old, old world where all the technology and engineering, food crops and domestication animals come from. Why aren't they all here? Well, the whole place was wiped out in the past. As he well knows, several times probably. All right, and all these regular people, what we consider native people, stumbled across all of these monuments and had nothing to do with them whatsoever. What they call mine and everything is that Mr. Davis's shop class junk all, you know, put together with mortar and odd stones and all that kind of stuff. And the perfectly cut stuff is some other civilization that we don't know anything about. And nobody talks about. Even alternative researchers don't even talk about it. They'll show you these places, but that's it. And they get billions of views for it without any sort of analysis at all. But in any case, guys, I thought you might want to hear about this legend of giants that you probably never heard about. And this giant horse, and that was a horse used for many giants in many stories, and how it, you know, leveling and clearing the land and creating trails and these are the things that are real that can be gleaned from these stories, okay? And maybe the past can be discerned if you know what you're looking for, okay? Like we do right here on this channel, okay? You're just as much as experts as I am. You know everything. If I, you watch all my videos, you know everything I do, all right? You're an expert at it now. So you make of it what you think it is, all right? Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed that story that you probably never heard about. So please do hit the like button. And if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe because I don't talk about the things that they talk about on Coast to Coast or Mainstream or anywhere else, okay? We're looking at the past from a different set of eyes, a fresh set of eyes that doesn't have any of these inherent biases, alternative or mainstream in them all right so please do hit the subscribe button and see what we're saying here all right anyway guys bugcat7 signing out peace